Welcome back to Deprogrammed. This is the New Culture Forum show where we do our best to fight back against the forces of ideological conformity, particularly among the young. My name is Harrison Pitt. I'm a senior editor at the European Conservative, and I'm joined today, as ever, by Connor Tomlinson, the host of Tomlinson Talks at thelotuseaters.com, and our special guest this week, very appropriate under the circumstances, Toby Young, the director of the Free Speech Union, editor-in-chief of The Daily Skeptic, and co-owner of Based Media. And of course, we do our best to provide on that front as well. Toby, thank you very much indeed for joining us on Deprogrammed. Thank you. The, the, the civil unrest appears to have quietened down in Britain quite a bit. Uh, but we've seen no shortage of people being imprisoned for mean tweets and uh, rage rhetoric online. By focusing single-mindedly on the so-called far right and conducting himself in such a, a vengeful manner, do you think Starmer has in some way lent on the police forces up and down the country and influenced the behaviour of magistrates? Well, I think he's bragged about um, uh, leaning on the authorities to um, bring the rioters to justice and let them feel the full force of the law. Um, and he certainly made it extremely clear that he wants um, as many people as possible to be prosecuted and to receive um, harsh sentences. And they duly have been. Um, and in due course, perhaps some of the people who've been sentenced and jailed may appeal either the sentences or um, the verdicts. Um, and... Um, it may be that they can refer to that as part of their appeals. One of the things we're doing at the Free Speech Union is we are submitting an FOI request to the CPS in England and Wales to see if the percentage of people pleading guilty, this is people who've been arrested and charged in connection with the recent disturbances, if the percentage of them pleading guilty is higher than average. We think it is. Um, and we suspect that um, many of the uh, people who've been arrested are being poorly advised um, and potentially told um, by the courts and the police that if they don't plead guilty, they'll be um, on remand for at least a year, won't be bailed, etc. We did hear from one person who said that um, he would pled guilty because um, he was told that his trial wouldn't be for at least a year he couldn't get bail. He'd be on remand for at least a year and he wanted to be home for Christmas. Um, so he, he pled guilty. Um, but I suspect a lot of that is going on. And I imagine this will come to light when people appeal. I mean, it's difficult if you've pled guilty to appeal, um, you know, um, uh, the verdict. Um, uh, not impossible, but, but hard. Uh, but you can nevertheless appeal the sentences. And in fact, lots of people who were um, uh, who received harsh sentences in 2011 for being involved in those riots, appealed those sentences successfully and got them reduced. So I think there's, you know, it's not the end of the story. Do you think as well that, so of course there's been a bit of a moral panic around this, 24-hour rolling uh, court proceedings. It's been, you know, all of the machinery of the British state has been willfully uh, put into gear in order to in order to address this and magistrates and police officers are as human as anyone else. They're going to be influenced by all of these, by all of these forces. Given that atmosphere, does it in some quite sinister sense actually, um, isn't it actually quite sensible for many people, for many people's solicitors to be counselling them to plead guilty, particularly given that many of these people are getting done on incitement to racial hatred charges, the language, they're very nebulous, often not, um, um, uh, the standards are not very exacting, can face a sentence if they, oh, of course there's the risk of being kept on remand, but there's also the risk that your sentence rather than being two years would be the maximum of seven years if you if you, if you you mm. draw out court proceedings. That must also be an incentive for defendants. Well, I imagine in some cases, yes, it is sensible to plead guilty, but I'm sure um, many more people have pled guilty than it was prudent to do so. Okay. Um, one of the things we've done at the Free Speech Union is we've said to our members that if they are arrested or even approached by the police in connection with something they've said on social media about the recent disturbances or the Southport killings, um, uh, they, we can put them in touch with a criminal solicitor uh, and we've given them a number to call. So if they are hauled into a police station, they'll, they'll be able to call that number with their phone call. And we promised them at the very least a free telephone consultation with a pretty good uh, criminal solicitor. And um, if we think it's a worthy case, then, you know, we'll pay for their defense. Um, 
I think um, uh, one reason I think it, it, it might be worth pleading not guilty in some cases, even if that does mean being on remand for you know a year or more, is that if you plead not guilty, you get a jury trial. Mm. And um, I'm not sure that the jurors, particularly in a year's time, yes. um, uh, uh, would be um, as angry as authoritarian in their response to things people have said on on social media. In some cases, you know, just um, reposting, sharing something that someone else has posted. Um, I'm not sure that juries will convict uh, people of what are, you know, um, potentially serious crimes carrying, you know, punitive custodial sentences uh, in a year's time. So I think, you know, in some cases, it might well be worth pleading not guilty. Very interesting. I wanted to ask about what possible ideological matters might be prejudicing these cases. I mean, we've seen today, time of recording, Lee, Lee Anderson and Richard Tice have written a letter to Home Secretary Yvette Cooper saying, hang on a minute, why are all these tweets from the Home Office saying these criminals will face the full force of the law when, unless they all have a criminal background ahead of this being their offence, and we, we know one woman, 50-year-old, made an inflammatory and inadvisable Facebook post, but was not a criminal beforehand, even said thank you when the judge sent her down. Uh, how can you prejudge all these people as criminals? Mm. Lots of the televised proceedings have had far from dispassionate language when the judges mm -hmm. have handed down these sentences. And some people have looked into the case history of some of these judges and they've given lighter sentences to actual sex offenders than they have to people making, again, inflammatory, ill-advised social media posts. Why do you think that the tensions are so high? Why do you think that the likes of Starmer and some of these prosecutorial judges are predisposed to have such vitriol towards their political opponents, but give lighter sentences to actual violent crimes. Yeah, it's, um, well, I think the, 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 the post you're referring to, which was a post on the Home Office's official uh, X account, um, it, 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 it said that more than a thousand people had been arrested in connection with the recent disturbances. It was boasting about the number of people that had been arrested. And um, at the top, it said, you know, it, it described all those people as criminals. And uh, as you say, Lee Anderson has written to Yvette Cooper um, uh, objecting to that. And the Free Speech Union has just written to Yvette Cooper as well. And we've made the point that um, Lee Anderson makes, which is a good one, which is um, under normal circumstances, if, um, uh, uh, if the Home Secretary or indeed a journalist described someone who'd been arrested but not yet charged. And not everyone who has been arrested has been charged. So the 55-year-old woman in Cheshire who was arrested last week uh, because she wrongly identified the Southport attacker as an asylum seeker on X, even though she qualified it by saying, if this is true, and deleted it when she discovered it wasn't. She hasn't been charged yet, but she's been arrested. So, And she's a member of the Free Speech Union. And we've made the point in our letter that for anyone to describe her as a criminal, particularly someone in a position of responsibility, when she hasn't yet even been charged, let alone found guilty, um, is, is contempt of court. Mm. Um, and, you know, as a journalist, I know that um, when someone's arrested or if they're charged but uh, haven't pleaded yet or if they pleaded not guilty and haven't been tried yet, you can't describe them as a criminal. You have to describe them as, you know, uh, the defendant. Um, uh, and, you know, it's just extraordinary that, um, I mean, effectively, Yvette Cooper is ultimately responsible for everything that's tweeted by the official Home Office account. It's extraordinary that one of the most kind of senior political figures in the country is effectively in contempt of court. Not only that, we've also pointed out that it could be a breach of Section 179 of the Online Safety Act, which is a new criminal offence committed by the Online Safety Act, which came into force in January of this year, whereby you can be prosecuted, and I think jailed for up to two years, if you say something um, that that, that, that you know to be false and which causes harm. Mm. And we're arguing that to describe all the people who've been arrested, given that some of them haven't even been charged yet, and some of them may have been charged but have pleaded not guilty and haven't yet been tried, to describe all of them as criminals, you know is false. Um, uh, and it does in fact cause harm. It causes harm to them if, they, if they're going to now think that the presumption of innocence isn't going to be extended to them. And it also, I think, causes psychological harm to people who've said, you know, mildly controversial things 
or even extremely controversial things on social media, but haven't yet, you know, been pinched for it, uh, they're now going to be terrified that if the police do knock on their door, the presumption of innocence isn't going to be extended to them. So we think it actually has caused this tweet by the Home Office, which Yvette Cooper is ultimately responsible for, has caused psychological harm, was knowingly false, and therefore she should be investigated <laughs> for breach of 179 of the Online Safety Act, which incidentally is what they're looking at the 55-year-old woman from Cheshire for. Um, so, um, I mean, I don't suppose we'll get a reply, but we have asked... Um, we have asked her to make sure that tweet is deleted and for her to clarify in a follow-up tweet that actually these people will have the presumption of innocence extended to them if they if they haven't been charged yet or if they have but haven't yet pleaded guilty. I'm sure they'll get round to it right after they deal with Nick Lowell's uh, inciting yeah. Muslim people yeah. to go out and defend against non-existent acid attacks. Yeah. I mean, I think there's an additional point here, which is that um, the immediate response of the Prime Minister to the disorder was to blame far-right agitators. Um, in many cases, um, I think he, he actually said, um, these are far-right agitators from outside the area. They're coming yes. in by train like football hooligans um, to these pre-arranged um, locations. <clears throat> um, to 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 uh, they've effectively organised a riot, which they're then travelling to to participate in. Um, I'm not sure how much evidence there is, or was then, that that's actually true. Did you see the BBC reporting on this the other day that said we couldn't actually find an organised central <clears throat> control nexus for the far right, and that's why lots of people participating were over 60s, children, and members of the local community. So they're almost scratching their head at how quote anarchic it was, and it just mm, shows yeah. there isn't. Unlike the Socialist Workers' Party or Stand Up to Racism, a central organising body for this is mm -hmm. just local people being outraged about mass immigration and what they see as the privileging of outsider communities and Islam in the legal system above their interests. Yeah. So um, I think it's, and I think um, there was some data about the initial wave of arrests showing that most people arrested were in fact locals and yes. only a minority from outside the areas where the disorder was happening. Um, so. Keir Starmer effectively, whether knowingly or not, has trafficked in misinformation about who is involved in the rioting and who is organising, instigating the rioting. And by saying it's people from outside your area, far right, anti-Muslim activists from outside your area that are coming in to attack mosques and attack Muslims, that effectively triggered local Muslim populations in those areas to organize counter protests. And during those counter protests, crimes were committed. You know, people identified as far right protesters were hunted down and attacked. Um, the police in some cases were attacked. So you could argue that Keir Starmer himself is guilty of a criminal offence under the Online Safety Act, the criminal offence that the authorities, he's urging the authorities to prosecute people for. He knowingly trafficked in false information, which definitely caused physical harm. I mean, it shows you really that, um, you know, terms like misinformation and disinformation, calculating whether they caused harm is so nebulous and subjective and imprecise um, that it makes no more sense to prosecute someone like the 55-year-old woman from Tresh Cheshire than it does the Home Secretary or the Prime Minister. Yes, indeed. But the, 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 I suppose one problem there, of course, is that the, the technically written letter of the law generally matters much less than the people who, are, who wield it and the people who are uh, in possession of the system more broadly, and given that, for want of a better word, people on our side don't have that sort of power and therefore are not um, uh, well positioned to try and make sure that the law is applied in a maximally impartial way, mm -hmm. how do we get around that difficulty? Well, I think it, it, it is a difficulty that the government is unwilling to acknowledge, um, let alone do anything about. But I think this perception has grown up yes. completely understandably yes. that um, we have a two-tier criminal justice system in this country. And um, people who are perceived as enemies of the regime um, uh, are much more severely dealt with than, than others um, in kind of designated, sacralized minority groups. Um, it's uh, the quiet part was said out loud in one particular courtroom. This is the BBC reported that a man was arrested in Nottinghamshire 
initially, I think, didn't enter a plea, but then pleaded guilty and was sent down for three years. And one of the things he pleaded guilty to, according to this BBC report, was anti-establishment <laughs> re- rhetoric. Yes. I mean, it's it, it's sort of sort of comically. Yes. Um, uh, kind of blatant, isn't yes. it? Um, uh, they don't usually say the quiet part out loud. And Reuters have subsequently done a fact yes, check in which yes. they've said the BBC, without being too hard on the BBC, have effectively said, no, no, this is misinformation <laughs> put out by the BBC. That wasn't actually one of the charges. That's not a criminal offence. Yeah. Um, but clearly, you know, the recorder, someone, you know, uh, wearing a wig yes. in that courtroom, um, uh, use that phrase, it's, which was quoted by the BBC. And you get these mask off moments. So, so even even when someone is on technically on trial for an incitement to violence charge or an incitement to racial hatred charge, and perhaps and potentially the criteria are genuinely met, the judges will still filter their verdict in many cases with language which has no bearing on the elements of the crime. Mm. So they won't just say you did fulfill this element of the crime. You did fulfill that element mm-hmm. of the crime in a dispassionate way. They'll say things like people with views like with the people with abhorrent views like yours have no place in a, in a civilized and democratic society. Like that is a mask off moment where you realize yeah. that look, magistrates, I'm sure, uh, uh, do their best to do their jobs, but they are human beings and they're just as prone to certain forms of cultural and ideological capture as anyone else. And under our woke moral order, applying Treating people unequally in order to make them more equal is just taken as an axiomatic value. For, for many of these people, it is the moral equivalent of being against kicking kittens in the face. Mm-hmm. So they don't actually think of themselves as acting in a, an ideological fashion when they mm-hmm. do that sort of thing. And so it goes to show how a, mm-hmm. a, a, a system which is, we're, we're told, is, is what has historically been the envy of the world, a sort of Rolls-Royce impartial justice system, is, 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 is prone to corruption and really depends on the people who constitute it. Yes, I think that's right. Uh, I mean, a good example of how captured the kind of um, lower levels of the courts and tribunal service uh, is, was the initial response um, to Maya Falstatter's um, claim in the employment tribunal when she lost her job. Can you, can you remind viewers so of this case? Maya because Falstatter I've it myself. is um, a feminist who was employed by, I think it was a legal charity. Okay. Um, and... Um, she uh, is a is a gender critical feminist, um, and had challenged gender identity ideology um, in a fairly robust way. But I don't think she'd actually misgendered any of her work colleagues. God misgendered, forbid. I mean, God forbid, called them by the correct gender. <laughs> um, and um, she 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 brought a case against her employer, claiming unfair dismissal. And she argued that under the Equality Act, her philosophical belief in the biological reality of sex Mm. should be a protected belief and therefore firing her for expressing that belief was discrimination. Um, And um, the initial verdict of the tribunal panel was that believing in the biological reality of sex isn't a belief worthy of respect in a democratic society. <laughs> you get, they use that language all the time. I mean, that, that, that was, that was, that's known as the Granger test. Yes. And t- to be fair to the courts and tribunal service, she appealed and the Employment Appeals Tribunal um, overruled Still, that judgment yes. and said, actually, no, believing in the biological reality of sex is worthy of respect in a democratic society. And it thereafter became a protected belief under the Equality Act. But the initial response was absolutely extraordinary and shows the extent to which the lower sections of the tribunal service anyway have been completely captured. And we know they're captured because, you know, organizations like Stonewall and Gendered Intelligence and all kinds of, you know, diversity grifters um, are employed to provide training to, you know, magistrates, yes. members of uh, tribunal panels and so forth, um, and uh, and the police. Um, so, you know, they're, they are, they're, they're completely um, pickled mm. in this ideology. It's also worthy of note on the idea that you bring in the grievance industrial complex to brainwash various politicians, civil servants and magistrates, that in the immediate aftermath of the Black Lives Matter protests, riots in the US, that were very disorderly, attempting to set fire to the cenotaph and had massive fights in Newcastle in the UK, that not only did nobody do jail time on the side of the... Uh, actually, I think one person did in Newcastle, one South African gentleman who was very drunk at the London protest did, so I will correct myself on that. Very few people did actual jail time and were prosecuted for the protest. But Keir Starmer not only took the knee, then did a down-camera thing saying that 
the grievances of the protesters were legitimate, unlike those in Southport, and then committed to have the entire Labour Party undergo unconscious bias training to ensure that they were ideologically primed to be in favour of the likes of Black Lives Matter and against the rioters he has since designated as far right. Yeah. I mean, I think um, what's becoming increasingly apparent, I had a kind of revelation when watching the opening ceremony of um, the Paris Olympics, um, in which there was the um, the, the much discussed um, sort of pastiche of the Last Supper, and um, lots of drag queens and trans models and so forth participating in the opening ceremony, and Macron proudly tweeting, "This is France." Yes. And um, what I think um, the revelation I had is that. Um, we are living in a kind of secular theocracy um, in which, like Iran, the regime um, identifies and gets its legitimacy in part from particular moral values, which it robustly upholds. And if you don't subscribe to that morality, and it is the morality of you know, radical progressive ideology, um, then you are considered more or less an enemy of the state. And, you know, things like the presumption of innocence, you know, unless you remind them, are not usually extended to you. Um, and um, I, I came up with this phrase, which was, um, we're living in a kind of technocratic theocracy. And that's true, not just of France, it's true of Britain too. It's true of America under Biden and will be true of America under Kamala Harris, um, uh, in which it's a kind of potent cocktail of um, technocratic managerialism and radical progressive ideology. And um, I think to the people who, who, who are kind of um, marinated in it, as you said, they don't think of it as politically contentious. They don't think of themselves as ideologues or as subscribing to a contentious, narrow ideological dogma. They just think of it as kind of common sense, as straightforwardly moral, righteous. Um, and, um, and, and somehow it's all mixed up. The idea that you can be uh, unburdened by doctrine and at the same time immediately blame, you know, spontaneous eruptions of discontent about mass migration on the far right um, uh, it, 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 without thinking of that as, you know, politically contentious. I mean, it's sort of it's part of this kind of. I think this this kind of um, uh, technocratic theocratic kind of, uh, the, the, that's what these regimes are um, across the West and, and increasingly becoming so. And I think one of the, one of the reasons um, uh, Keir Starmer was so quick to blame uh, misinformation and disinformation on social media, one of the reasons the Digital Services Act was passed in the European Union, one of the reasons for the hostility to Elon Musk is that social media is um, a vehicle for the expression of dissent from uh, this rather narrow set of technocratic, radically progressive values. Um, and they, they're, not, they're not at all inhibited um, about you know, advertising their hostility to dissenters and seeking to punish them in various ways. I mean, I think what, what's been disturbing about the um, uh, response of the authorities to the recent disturbances is that hitherto, if you said something heretical on social media, you know, you, will, you, you, you could risk being cancelled, maybe placed under investigation at work, losing your job. You could lose your social media account or it could be temporarily closed, but you are unlikely to end up in jail. Um, I mean, in a few cases, there have been kind of high profile examples of people who've been prosecuted, um, like the Finnish parliamentarian for challenging, you know, radical progressive dogma on LGBT rights. Quoting the Bible in the process, yes. Exactly. Or even, uh, even Count Dankula posting a, an edgy joke back on YouTube. A, a few isolated examples. Yes. But for the most part, you know, you didn't have to worry about being sent to prison if you uh, challenged kind of technocratic theocracy um, on social media. Now I think you do. That's also, and so that's also because... So in your, what you're saying is, is is very true, and there's a sense in which decentralized social media platforms pose as much of, a, of an insurgent challenge to what you're calling the technocratic theocracy under which we live, as the printing press did to the authority of the Catholic Church in the in the 16th century. Um, 
Luther, if he'd been born, if he'd been writing in 1417 as opposed to 1517, would probably just be a, a singular burnt heretic, and we wouldn't have heard of him. But his message could uh, he had a vehicle for his message, message because he was he was he was writing and uh, preaching and teaching after the invention of the Gutenberg press in the late. 15th century, in the late 15th century, um, but the, the, the difficult, this difference in our case, and this is where the case of, of, of um, most people ha just having their accounts shut down rather than being prosecuted by the police comes in, is that up until now, the, as it were, the barons of social media have cooperated with the regime. They've been co-opted by the mm -hmm. regime. In the case of Elon Musk, you have a sort of rogue baron mm -hmm. who doesn't go along with that um, mm -hmm. technocratic theocracy of which you speak, and therefore does provide a platform for people to challenge it, and therefore the regime has nothing else to do. You can't instruct Mark Zuckerberg to shut the, mm -hmm. this down because Mark Zuckerberg is not in charge of it. Um, it, it, has no, it, it must resort to law, and that's what we're, we've already seen in the form of the Online Safety Act. And I, I want to ask you what you think the prospects for free speech are more broadly in this country. What is the government going to try to do mm -hmm. to bring this rogue baron we have in the form of Elon Musk to heal? Well, um, uh, I think at one stage, Stephen Parkinson, the Director of Public Prosecutions, I think it was him said that um or maybe it was mark rowley uh that they didn't rule out trying to extradite <laughs> it was, yes um it was uh, rowley yeah. it was, it was of rowley, course yeah. it was rowley um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, he didn't i don't think he named elon musk but that was clearly who he just he didn't rule, he was asked about he, he the, the interviewer named elon musk and he right. and he yes. right yeah. um and um we actually published a good piece in the um daily skeptic recently um by someone called joshua trevino he wrote a fantastic essay about um, the state of Britain. He came here with his son on as a kind of summer treat for his wife and son. And um, uh, his son is a huge Anglophile. And, um, and it was during the kind of summer riot. So he witnessed some of it up close. And he wrote this fantastic magisterial kind of uh, woe is England mm. essay, which we republished in The Daily Skeptic, was originally on his substack. He wrote a more recent piece in which he said that even though um, everyone laughed and ridiculed Mark Rowley when he suggested that, you know, Elon Musk could be extradited and brought to justice in the UK for, you know, for, for, for allowing all these inflammatory things to appear on his platform, Joshua pointed out that actually that, that could happen under um, uh, Tim Wall's uh, Kamala Harris regime. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, they, might, they might willingly kind of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> throw him to the wolves. Th throw, throw Elon Musk to um, <laughs> Keir Starmer's yes. wolves, yeah. Um, I think there are... I mean, I think um, the, the government has said um, it's reviewing the Online Safety Act mm. um, and may well reintroduce uh, one of the clauses which was stripped out thanks to the work of the Free Speech Union and other pro-free speech lobby groups um, when the online safety bill, as it then was, was going through Parliament, there was a provision uh, whereby it didn't actually use, the words legal but harmful yeah. never actually appeared. It's in the guidance. In, in the bill, it's in the guidance, yeah. yeah. But there was a provision which would have allowed the Secretary of State at DCMS, now Lisa Nandy, um, to um, draw up a list of prohibited content, which was legal, but which social media companies would be obliged to remove on pain of being fined up to 10% of their annual global turnover, which in Facebook's case is over 10 billion. Um, and, um, uh, and we thought that was a hostage to fortune. Uh, it was clearly a hostage to fortune. And that a future Labour Secretary of State, which at that point didn't look terribly unlikely, um, could easily include on this kind of prohibited list um, uh, any criticism of kind of flagship Labour policies like their immigration policy, for instance. Well, even at the time, Nadine Dorries, who was Digital Media, Culture and Sports Secretary, had suggested on Sky News that Jimmy Carr might be subject to prosecution yeah. for his contentious joke about gypsies and the Holocaust. Yeah, so the prospect of Nadine Dorries kind of, um, you know, um, clutching the red pen was was alarming enough, <laughs> yes. but, but, but you know that that that, that 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 was mild compared to the prospect of Lisa Nandy being yes. able to wield that pen. And um, if the government reintroduces that clause, which I think is you know more likely than not, then that's exactly what we'll see. Um, content that's currently legal um, will be banned on social media companies, and they'll have to remove it, um, uh, which is, you know, uh, deeply alarming. I mean, alarming for a number of reasons, not the least of which is one of the kind of sacrosanct principles of English common law is that if something isn't explicitly prohibited, then it's permitted, mm -hmm. you know, in contrast to the continent, where unless something is explicitly permitted, it's prohibited. 
And clearly that's one of the kind of linchpins of English liberty. And um, if you create this gray area, lawful but awful, legal but harmful, um, you're muddying, you know, you're, you're, you're blurring that sacrosanct principle. Um, and, you know, um, all our liberties will suffer as a consequence. Yes. It's also very interesting how when, when, well, not that I admire the Conservative government particularly, but when they did one of the few think good things they did do was passing the academic, um, the, the academic freedom bill. And that would have empowered a, a, a university's czar to uphold the principle of free speech on campus. And the complaint that would, was often leveled at this proposal was that, gosh, you're giving far too much power to this one official uh, to make decisions for himself. It's funny how when the, 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 how when the, um, the imperative is to silence speech that being ultra permissive Give, giving wide remit to an official yeah. is perfectly okay. But when it comes to upholding it, it that's yeah. all of a sudden no, yeah. very in, alarming. Yeah. In effect, if they do uh, put this clause back into the online safety bill, yes. Lisa and Andy will become the anti-free speech czar. Well. Exactly that. Yeah. Exactly yeah. that. But so that, that brings us to the, the academic freedom bill as well. Because yeah. it, so, well, okay, so that's, maybe we should go to this first before we get to, to, to um, universities, which for, for many of our viewers will be a, a remote concern, given that many of them, I suspect, already think that they're lost. Um, we're also likely to see an Islamophobia bill um, coming down the pike. There were murmurings of this before the election. Starmer um, uh, 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 um, was interviewed in a very uh, soft fashion, of course, by Sadiq Khan, in which he said that this was a, this was a clear mission of his next government uh, to make sure that Islamophobia has no place in a free and democratic society, all that, all that sort of thing. I think it's also especially likely, uh, given the fact that it won't, in the case of Labour, it won't just be the result of political ideology will also be the result of electoral cynicism because Labour, since Tony Blair, has been ultra-dependent for its um, uh, democratic ascendancy, having long ago ditched solidarity with, with the working man for the politics mm -hmm. of racial minority grievance, been very dependent on these sort of ethnic minority voting blocs, and is particularly hemorrhaging the Muslim vote, not as much as was predicted in 20, um, earlier this year, but uh, uh, over the issue of Gaza, they're going to fe feel a need mm -hmm. to appease them yep. uh, by, by turning them into a, an even more protected class than they already are. What do, how, how do you see that developing? Yeah, I think, um, well, um, I think uh, Keir Starmer wants to criminalise Islamophobia and Islamophobia as defined by the all-party parliamentary group on British Muslims, which, as you know, includes any criticism at all of the religion of Islam, including any reference to the fact that the religion has sometimes been imposed um, at the end of a sword by force, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, that would be, that would be, that would fall under the definition of Islamophobia, mm -hmm. according to this very poorly thought out, far too capacious definition that the all-party parliamentary group came up with, which would mean that Tom Holland would be guilty of yes. Islamophobia because he's written an accurate history of Islam. Um, uh, I'm not sure it'll take the form of a bill. Okay. Um, we've seen what Keir Starmer can achieve just by leaning on mm -hmm. the authorities. Um, I think it's possible that, uh, I mean, the Labour Party has already embraced the APPG's definition of Islamophobia. Um, it could be that that definition is given a more formal official status. And, um, uh, and, it's, and, and part of the training that, you know, magistrates, tribunal panels and so forth will receive will include this definition of Islamophobia. And I would have thought it could be um, uh, wrapped up in the offence of either stirring up racial hatred see, or stirring yes. up religious hatred. And it, so I think it's just, I think, I think by, by, by leaning on the CPS, the DPP, the police, um, the courts and tribunal service, the government will be able to effectively criminalise Islamophobia uh, without actually passing a bill. And we saw the beginnings of this in some of the prosecutions mm. um, in connection with the recent disturbances. So someone... I think got 18 months yes. for chanting who the F is Allah outside Downing Street. But for taking interest in divine ontology, I, you know, it's astonishing. Uh, I, I, but also in, the, in this case, um, it's very interesting that you say that because I hadn't thought of that. I thought it was going to take the form of a bill, but that it, it's not necessary because the definition, the all parliamentary definition, it doesn't just say the th very, the very um, incipiently threatening thing, attacks on perceived Muslimness, which could... Which, is, which gives very wide remit indeed. It says Islamophobia is rooted in racism and is itself racist. And so it's got that language yep. 
baked into yeah. it. And so people who are applying the law around incitement to racial yes. hatred will have recourse yeah. to that and yeah. all the rest and, of it. And it's easier to prosecute someone for stirring up racial hatred than it is for stirring up religious hatred. The yes. threshold is higher for religious mm. hatred. Yes. So yeah, I, I expect that's the that's the route this will take. Um, but as you say, that's not the only threat to free speech. I mean, we've heard Yvette Cooper last week talking about um, uh, wanting to define extreme misogyny as terrorism. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, any any schoolboy um, caught with um, a skin mag behind the bike sheds presumably now will be referred to prevent. Well, how are they, they going to square that with Andrew Tate? Because obviously, is he a protected characteristic under being an Islamist or is he uh, an extreme misogynist on the precipice of causing incel shootings? Well, um, I mean, you make a good point um, because um, uh, I imagine that a lot of traditional conservative Muslims um, uh, who want to, for instance, sexually segregate audiences or who object to um, their um, daughters becoming lesbians um, uh, will could easily fall afoul of this um, new enlarged definition of what constitutes terrorism. Um, so it won't play very well with the, you know, um, uh, uh, Muslim groups that Labour is trying to keep within its, um, you know, electoral fold. Um, so, so, so that's one threat. I think another threat is that um, uh, we may see the government trying to pass um, the Westminster equivalent of the Scottish Hate Crime Act, mm -hmm. um, adding many more um, uh, uh, categories that you can be prosecuted for stirring up hatred against, just as the Scottish Hate Crime Act did. Um, uh, and um, the Law Commission of England and Wales has actually got an oven ready um, uh, hate crime and public order England and Wales bill, which they tried to foist on the last government, but mm. various efforts were made to kind of see that off. Yes. I think that could easily be resurrected under this government. Um, I think it's. It, could I ask a very quick question just on that point, yeah. Toby, if I may? You, one of the concerns in Scotland in particular was that it wasn't just public posts, it was potentially, I think this was true in Ireland as well, I don't know the legal framework as well as I might, but also focusing on what people um, are reported as saying within the home and what yeah. they might be saying in WhatsApp chats, would that be included under this oven-ready legislation? And, and of course, Labour in both Scotland and Wales voted for those sorts of amendments. Yes. Um, yeah, the, the, there's something called the dwelling defence. That's right. Um, whereby you can't be prosecuted for stirring up hatred um, in the privacy of your own home. Mm -hmm. And um, that was, um, there was an attempt to preserve that defence when the um, Hate Crime Public Order Scotland bill was going through Holyrood. Um, and that was defeated by, in part, um, Labour MPs as well as SNP MPs. I think it was supported by the Conservative MSPs. Um, but um, so, yeah, that could be scrapped in England and Wales too. Um, and that raises the prospect um, of um, children being summoned as witnesses for the prosecution in court when their parents are being accused of stirring up hatred, you know, at the kitchen table saying, for instance, they don't think trans women are women or they don't think genetically male boxers should be competing against female boxers in the Olympics. Um, and, you know, which, which conjures up the kind of spectre of a kind of, you know, the Soviet era in which children are required by the state to denounce their parents in court. Um, so yeah, that, 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 that's, that's an incredibly worrying prospect, I think. Um, yes. I think, again, more probable than not. Um, I think another is you know, Chris Bryant was one of the ministers appointed at DCMS. He is probably the most prominent uh, campaigner for Hacked Off. He passionately believes in state regulation of the press. He, he has been campaigning for years to force newspapers and magazines to take the knee to a state approved press regulator. That regulator already exists in the form of Impress. It just has very few respectable publications that have signed up to be regulated by it. Most of them signed up with Ipso. But I can easily imagine the present government forcing newspapers and magazines to bend the knee to Impress, which uh, uh, to call it, I'm sure Chris Bryant would dispute my description of it as a state approved press regulator, but the fact is the chairman of Impress is appointed by the Secretary of State at DCMS, so it is effectively state controlled. Isn't Bryant the same chap also who completely fabricated claims that Nigel Farage was being paid by the Russian government and still hasn't retracted that? 
Yes, he hasn't. I don't think he said it outside Parliament, has he? So no, um, no, but uh, probably not the most credible and impartial person to be governing the press. Let's put it that way. No. If anyone watching now, and I suspect if I know our audience that um, is feeling chilled by a lot of um, these um, these predictions and the, these uh, probabilities that you're uh, putting before us, Toby, what should and indeed as well um, as a secondary aspect, if they are feeling put upon at work. Or, or, or elsewhere, particularly if they're working in the public sector, what, what should they do? Well, they should join the Free Speech Union. <laughs> Thanks for teeing that up. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's um, uh, yes. uh, we've 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 now got um, uh, I think we've now got eighteen thousand members. Mm -hmm. um, so we grew, not surprisingly, very quickly um, in the past month mm. um, on a single in a single hour. Last week, we had more people join than in the entire month of June. Wow. And we've increased in size by about 25% in the past month because people are terrified of what this new government is going to do and what it might do to them. And um, once you become a member of the Free Speech Union, and you know, if, if you're a veteran or a pensioner or a student, it's only 29 99 a year. Full membership is 59 99 I mean, it's, it's pretty cheap considering the peace of mind it brings and the kind of support you'll get if you get into trouble for exercising your lawful right to free speech. We don't absolutely guarantee, you know, we'll wheel out the legal big guns if you do get in trouble, but most of the time we do. Um, and <clears throat> uh, we've taken on over 2,700 cases in the past almost five years. Um, we've achieved a successful outcome about 75% of the time. We've now got 23 members of staff. We've got a four-person case team, no, a five-person case team now, a four-person legal team. Um, we're, we're at the forefront, I think, of defending free speech, particularly under this government. So we have brought the first legal challenge um, against the government over Bridget Phillips and the Education Secretary's decision to pause the Higher Education Freedom of Speech Act, which we think was ultra virus. We think she's acting unlawfully because it was passed by both houses of parliament um, and had party support um so we'll see what we we'll see what happens there but we've essentially threatened her with a judicial review unless she does a reverse ferret i don't think she will um so um yeah if you care about free speech if you're worried about getting into trouble for something you have said or might say at work or on social media um and serious trouble now as we're beginning to see um then yeah join the free speech union it's um it's freespeechunion.org slash join slash but i suppose the whole presupposition of the free speech union's mission and it's certainly a noble one and i admire all the work that you're doing is that the law is fundamentally on the side of free speech and on the side of, of of people keen to exercise their free speech rights in ways which might otherwise be considered unpopular all of these pro prognostications we're talking about mm -hmm. we're, we're discussing <laughs> ways in which the law is being engineered against free speech and against the people so once the law ceases to be on our side what, how, how does the mission of places like the Free Speech Union need to morph in some way? Well, um, at the moment, um, we, we, we confine our legal defense of people uh, to people who we don't think have broken the law. Um, uh, but if more laws are passed, which restrict what we're able to say, um, then we might have to revise that policy. I mean, the reason for that policy is we have so many demands on our staff, yes. so many requests for help. We've currently got, I think, 175 open cases that we have to limit ourselves to those cases we think are winnable and not just, you know, expend resources as a matter of principle in every case. Sometimes we do. Um, but um, in the case of, say, Keir Starmer's efforts to criminalize Islamophobia, um, particularly if it doesn't involve primary legislation. I think that will be eminently challengeable um, under the Human Rights Act. Um, you know, I'm not a particular fan <laughs> of the Human Rights Act. I'm not a particular fan of the European Court of Justice, but or the European Court of Human Rights, rather. But, um, you know, we have to use the tools available to us. Uh, and I think, um, I mean, I think in the case of um, uh, the um, imposition of VAT, on independent school fees, which the government has said it wants to do, and it is going to pass primary legislation to achieve that. Um, I think that could easily be a breach of um, Article 2 of the European Convention 
on human rights, which is the right to education. Uh, no other country um, imposes VAT on school fees. And um, uh, uh, I think if we were still a member of the EU, it wouldn't be possible. Um, uh, so um, I think that may be winnable. I think there'll be various ways to challenge overreach when it comes to the erosion of our liberties by the present government, legally challenge them, which will, I think, um, be awkward and embarrassing for this government, which professes to be great believers in the law, particularly international law, in human rights, great supporters of the European Convention on Human Rights and so forth. So if we can, if we can um, uh, challenge them by appealing to those various sacred texts, then I think, I think we'll at least embarrass them. Do you think there's room as well, Toby, or indeed it, 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 it's an imperative for this free speech union not just to do uh, representative work for people who, who, who find themselves in trouble for exercising their free speech rights, but also to act as a kind of uh, lobbying group and, and think tank of sorts, making sure that free speech is a more uh, uh, um, cherished value in our society and indeed d d d doing uh, your utmost to try and shore up our domestic free speech protections because while it's of course embarrassing for the government to have these uh, texts quoted back at them in, in 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 this sort of underhand way it's also slightly embarrassing for us to have to have to have to defend our free speech rights by recourse to things like the equality act and to, by recourse to things like the human rights act and the european convention on human rights which which in an item ceteris paribus i wouldn't want mm -hmm. to have anything to do with anyway mm -hmm. do you think that we should be trying to lobby uh, bodies like the fsu should be lobbying to, to promote a more, a, a more robust free speech culture and also trying to shore up our domestic protections on free speech. Yes, and, and we do that. Um, uh, we, 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 I mean, when I first set up the Free Speech mm. Union, um, I thought um, free speech is silted up in all kinds of ways um, by fairly recent um, legislation. What we really need to do is strip away um, all those fetters and restore the English common law breach of the peace principle, which was, you know, our First Amendment. In fact, the First Amendment is really just the American version of the English common law breach of the peace principle. I mean, in 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 the famous Supreme Court case Brandenburg versus Ohio, where the Brandenburg test was established, it was it was determined that speech enjoys the protection of the First Amendment unless it's going to cause imminent lawless action. And it has to be a very direct cause, and it has to be um, uh, immediate. Otherwise, it, it enjoys the protection of the First Amendment. And that's a very good standard. And I think if we had the First Amendment in this country and that test was applied, almost no one has been prosecuted for things they've said in, on social media in connection with the recent disturbances could have been prosecuted. And um, the English common law breach of the peace principle is that speech within the obvious limits, you know, we're not defending child pornography, we're not defending betrayal of state secrets, we're not defending indiscriminate libel. But within those obvious limits, speech should be permitted unless it's going to cause an imminent breach of the peace. That used to be the principle until the mid-60s when the Race Relations Act was passed. And then it became a crime to intend to stir up hatred, you know, intend effectively to breach the peace, whether the peace was breached or not. That was a significant departure a Rubicon crossing moment in which we resiled from that essential bulwark of English liberty. And in an ideal world, yes, we would return to the English common law breach of the peace principle. We would have our version of the First Amendment. And perhaps, you know, one of the, uh, perhaps the successful candidate in the conservative leadership election can be persuaded to embrace something like that. It's politically obviously very difficult. But anyway, when I first set up the Free Speech Union, that was my vision. Yes. This is what we're going to campaign for, and this is achievable. And that turned out to be naive, and we've spent nearly all our legislative efforts on stopping things getting any worse, <laughs> rather than making them any better. <laughs> Quite. Um, and we, we, we succeeded under the last government on a few occasions, not least by uh, uh, improving at least the online safety bill as it made its way through parliament by persuading the government to pass the higher education freedom of speech act and so forth all of which is now under threat from the present government and we'll do our best to defend free speech but the, the chances of actually improving anything under this government i think are pretty slim but that doesn't mean we won't campaign for it um i think it's uh, i mean i think i remember listening to this documentary on radio 4 um about the sas's activity in greece um, I think in 1941, 42, around there. 
and and it interviewed some of the local Greeks who were aware of this activity, who in some cases had, had provided help uh, to these um, uh, behind enemy lines operatives. Mm. And, uh, and, and it was pointed out that nothing the SAS did, you know, in Greece did much to kind of disrupt the Nazi war machine. It was like, you know, they were, they were kind of um, uh, making a very minor impact and any damage they did was quickly repaired. Uh, they were just like gnats, you know, pesky flies rather than, you know, serious enemies. Um, and the local, this one local Greek man said, yes, that's, I won't do a Greek accent. <laughs> he said, yes, that's true. It might, might not have had much impact on the Nazi war machine. But from a morale point of view, it was incredibly important to know that they were there, that there were people out there defying mm. this authoritarian regime that was causing so much misery and pain in our communities. Um, just to know that they were there, that there was a band of, of fighters out there resisting um, that was inc an incredibly important morale booster. That gave us hope. That made us realize all is not lost. And without wishing to sound too self-aggrandizing, that's how I think of organizations like the FSU. It may be that they appear to be fighting a losing battle. They're not making much of a dent in this unbelievably authoritarian regime and its unending assault on free speech. But nevertheless, the fact that we're there, we're making the effort, we're standing up for these values, I think does give people hope. It's a morale booster. It lets people know that, you know, there is still some fight left in the British people. Well, listen, Toby Young, keep up the excellent work, even though we all wish it wasn't necessary. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on Deprogrammed this week. Connor, thank you as ever. You've been watching Deprogrammed. Make sure to like, subscribe, leave a comment if you wish to do so, and we shall see you on the next one. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as £3 per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember, to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.